Father, thank you for the opportunity just to be still. And remember that you are God. And we thank you, Lord, just for the blessing and privilege of turning around away from everything else in life and spending an hour here with you and with people we love to be with. And as we look into your word, I pray, Lord, you'd speak to our hearts. Help us to hear you, my God, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of uh, over this last few weeks with leading up to our 20th anniversary, I've been kind of, a lot of memories have been coming kind of through to me and uh, thinking through uh, so much that's happened over those years. Uh, I distinctly remember the very first Sunday we had service, October the 4th uh, in 1998, and uh, I distinctly remember we had rented the function room, which was on the lower floor in what was then the Inn at Medford on Route 112 by the expressway. And I clearly remember that morning, um, we knew of kind of about a dozen people who were going to be there. And uh, setting off from our house, we had got a load of equipment, microphones, and Lord knows what else that we needed to do it. Setting off with all that in the van, driving down there, and this thought going through my mind, what if nobody comes? Right? Because that was a distinct possibility. Like, what if we start this church, but actually nobody wants to come to it? And now I look back over 20 years of our history, and I thought, that was what I was wondering then, but God had different plans. But God had different plans. This, this past week was six years since we got the key to this building. Now, getting the key to this building and actually being able to move in and use it were two different things. Because what we had was a few offices up front and a huge warehouse. And that year and three months was what really aged me. That was a fascinating 15 months. There was a point in that process where the Department of Health were putting such pressure on us to, to do something that was totally unnecessary to do, and it would have cost us $90,000, which we didn't have. And basically, if they had insisted on that, we would have been totally stuck in the middle of a project we couldn't finish with a building we're renting but can't use. And then one afternoon, I got a phone call from a lady I barely knew. and She asked me, how's it going? And I told her, and she said, leave it with me. Within 24 hours, she called me back, and she said, I fixed up an appointment with the, the uh, guy in charge of the health department, the guy in charge of, uh, of water, waste, whatever, and, and a, a top representative from Suffolk County. Can you come? <laughs> well, I'll check my calendar. <laughs> they wanted to impose some incredible, unnecessary things on us that really would have sunk us, but God had different ideas. And that afternoon, the whole thing was turned around so that all that became unnecessary. But God, but God, we, we were, some of you remember this, we were about a month away from completion here. We now were down to the wire where we knew exactly what bills were still going to be outstanding and what we still had to pay. And we realized that we were in this position now and we were going to be $40,000 short. Now, we've never been the kind of church that seems to attract people who've got an extra $40,000 in their hip pocket. <laughs> and folks had given sacrificially and had given so generously. And now we're in this position of like, how the heck are we going to get finished? And it seemed as if this was a humongous last hurdle that might be really difficult for us. But God had different ideas. And over the next two weeks from all over the place, some of them quite unexpectedly, miraculously, $40,000 came in so that when we opened this building for our first service on Christmas Eve in 2013, it was complete and we didn't owe anybody a dime. <laughs> Do 
Somebody said to me this week, what's this but God teaching about? Well, that's just an introduction. Because the truth is, we've all got stories here today where we can say, seemed as if I was going in this direction. Seemed as if I was headed for disaster. Seemed as if I wasn't really going to make it back up again. But God turned things around. And sometimes it was conspicuously God, and other times things changed, and we didn't realize, but it really was God who was behind the scenes, who was making things move. And what I want to do over the next few weeks is I want to look at a number of uh, times in the Bible where this phrase is used, because it occurs over and over and over again. And today I want to remind us to remind ourselves of this simple truth, God can do what we can't do. That's why He's God and we're not. God can do what we can't do. Now, we're going to read some verses from Ephesians chapter 2 this morning, and we're going to spend, you know, most of our morning looking around these particular verses. Uh, If you've got a Bible with you and want to open it, it's Ephesians 2 verse 4. If you've got the U version, the Bible app, you want to open it, Uh, Ephesians 2 verse 4, I'm reading the New Living Translation. Um, Or let me just say this, to add on to what Charlotte mentioned earlier, um, if you open the Bible app and hit the more link, it does bring up our church, it does give you all of kind of our announcements for what's coming up, but if you scroll down further, it gives you the whole outline of, of the morning's teaching as well. And all the Bible verses that are being used are there. The main points that go up on the screen are there. And there's actually space if you're a note taker that you can actually add some notes of your own while you're there. Okay? So that's all there in the version app. So let, let's read these verses from Ephesians 2. Verse 4, But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness toward us as shown in all He has done for us who are united in Christ Jesus. God raised us from the dead. Jesus was born into a Jewish culture. The gospel, the church, was first established in a Jewish culture. And then the gospel was taken out further afield into Gentile areas and to Gentile nations. But there was still in some areas a kind of almost like a, where the Jewish people were like, well, we're really the chosen ones and you were allowed to come in. Uh, And there was this little bit of kind of competition there, one-upmanship. And in Ephesians, Paul is writing to these Christians in Ephesus, and he's trying to tell them there very clearly, listen, let's get this totally straight. And he attacks exclusivism, if that's a real word. He, he, he goes after it. You know, the whole concept that, that there, there's some, there was some race that were better than some other race, that the Jews were really the, the chosen, and everybody else was just an appendage tolerated by God. And he goes after that to make this point. Listen, when it comes to it, we're all the same. And one of the things I love about church is, is that's it. There's no one-upmanship here. There's nobody trying to strut their spiritual stuff as like, you know what, you know, I'm really up here somewhere. And you, uh, yeah, I guess with a bit of luck you might make it one day. There's none of that stuff. And if there was, I'll read you the Bible verses now that will totally destroy it. All right? Ephesians chapter 2 is the verse that comes before the one we just read. Verse 1, as for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins. Jewish believers, Gentile believers, hey, here's news. 
Before you knew Jesus, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And here's the deal. You know, it doesn't matter what we've got in the bank, haven't got in the bank. Regardless of what our education level might be, regardless of what our ethnicity might be, or of any other factor, the truth is this. There's some common ground here. And the common ground is, before we knew Jesus, we were dead in our transgressions and sin. Right? That puts us on level ground. Pretty low down level ground. But it puts us on level ground. In Ephesians 6 and verse 23, it says this quite clearly. For the wages of sin is death. It says this is where you were. In fact, in chapter 7 then of, of Romans and verse 10, here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I found that the commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. What, what he's saying there is he's referring to the Ten Commandments. And he said, I don't find the Ten Commandments cheer me up. They make me feel bad. Right? I mean, you can start where you like and say, well, I didn't kill anybody. Of course, then you've got to balance that out with what Jesus said when he expanded on that and said, you know, if you say anything wrong about anybody, you as good as kill them. So, you know, the Ten Commandments don't make us feel good. The Ten Commandments show us how f short we fall. He says they actually brought death. They, they, they emphasize the fact that what we deserve is punishment because we're all sinners. Colossians 2 and verse 13. When you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. That, says Paul, is where we all were. We were dead. I, 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 uh, this makes me think of the story in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, God takes Ezekiel the prophet. He wants to make a point to him. So he takes him to this valley. Uh, and the Bible says the valley was full of dry bones. It was like skeletons, but they were all kind of scattered all over the place. Bones and bits and pieces that were scattered all over the place. Uh, and, and it says that Ezekiel says, and, and, he, and he heard God say to him, and God said, Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? That's tough if you're Ezekiel, isn't it? It's like, is this a trick question? What's the answer that he's looking for? Because if I say yes, he might say, okay, go do it. And if I say no, I might get in trouble. So Ezekiel did a very smart thing. He said, God, you know the answer. Very smart man, Ezekiel. That's why he's got a whole book in the Old Testament. He said, God, you know, the because the fact is, left to it, this was just death, and there was nothing you could do about it. These were just scattered, dead bones, and there was nothing any mortal could do about it. Paul says in Ephesians 2, as for all of you, before you knew Christ, you were dead. Nothing you could do about it. And you can't. I've heard people say, you know, I'd love to go into, you know, I'd really like to go into the funeral home, and I'd just like to pray, and, and the, it, what, you know, if I prayed and the person came back to life, what a miracle. Everybody would believe in God. No, they wouldn't. They'd run for the door screaming. <laughs> what are you talking about? You pee your pants. I mean, tell the truth. <laughs> I mean... No, because dead people don't come back to life. Now, don't get me wrong. I know there are instances where very much so that's happened. But, here's the but they don't. They can't, you can't make yourself come back from the dead. Paul says, listen, never forget where you were before you knew God. You were dead because of your sin. A person without Christ, however nice they are and however good they are, the Bible says is spiritually dead. Now, my eyes are playing up this morning. Jonathan Edwards was a New England preacher who was really the person who started a great, an incredible revival called the Great Awakening. And here's what Jonathan Edwards said years ago. He said, the problem is with, the problem is with man's moral nature, which is opposed to God. The will is always free. 
We always choose what we judge best in a given situation. But as sinners, we always judge wrongly. That would be a good place to say amen. Because that would mean you, right? Because ain't that the truth? Without Christ in our lives, we did what we thought was best, but we always did wrongly. In fact, here's what it says in Ephesians 2 and verse 2. It says, you let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. Hello? You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. Like the very people sometimes that we've allowed to be our example or our guide are, are, are actually people who haven't got a clue about how to get their own lives straight. I, I often hear people ask, so what do you think about, you know, what, how do you define God? What do you think about God? And they say, well, you know, I don't believe God's a person. I, I, believe, I, I believe God's goodness that's all around us. And other people say, well, what do you think about God? Well, I just think that every time we show love that there's God. And it's like, can we stop the blind leading the blind? And like, you want to find out about God? It's in the book. It's in the book. But so often, we took our direction from people who didn't know which way was up themselves. And then it goes on and says this in the next verse. It says, we all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. Right? Hello, you're in church. Tell the truth. We all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing, not hurting anybody else. It's just my choice. We do what we feel like doing. All of us in the same boat. Look at this next bit. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with a whole lot of us. Wow. And then we just take it one step further. Look at this verse in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. There, folks, very simply, is where we were without Christ. And if you haven't fully committed your life to Christ here today, nobody's saying you're a bad person, not in the slightest. But we're simply saying you need to recognize the fact that spiritually you are dead, right? Now, the person who is dead cannot bring themselves back to life. Agreed? All right, just think about it for a moment. I'll ask you again. All right, the person who is dead cannot bring themselves back to life. Agreed? Agreed. Right? You can't do it. So here we were. It says we're, we're, we're dead. We're kind of following our own whims. We're going along with the crowd of what other people are involved in. We are in danger of the wrath of God, right? That's where we are. You ready? But God... But God, here it is, what we could not do for ourselves, what we could never accomplish for ourselves, but God, look again at verse 4, but God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace you've been saved, for He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. But God, when we were dead in sins, God gave us life. Look at what it says there. It says He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. So the resurrection of Jesus was the promise of eternal life for everybody who trusts in Jesus. We couldn't do this. God did it for us. Look what it says next. It says, He raised us from the dead. It's like, wait a minute, I'm still breathing. No. No, He raised us from the dead because you can be still breathing and be spiritually dead. So what God has done is He's raised us from the dead. And look what it goes on and says. It says, He has seated us with Him, that's with Jesus, in the heavenly realms. 
say, okay, wait a minute, it's getting a bit crazy because I'm sitting on a chair here. But in God's plan, He talks about this already as a done deal. God sees us already raised, already seated with Christ in heavenly places. I love this bit. Right? Because the fact is I may be here and I am here. That's good, right? So we're here, but the reality is that, you know what it says elsewhere in the New Testament? It says, but we're citizens of heaven. So we're here, but we're only here for the time being. We're only here for the duration because God's already fixed this, that actually we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So today, living here, I am a child of God. Today, living here, I've got a place in the throne room of heaven. Today, sitting here, I have already, my life has already been saved. I have already been rescued. Death's sting has already been taken away. And I belong with Christ in heavenly places. And you look at that and think, yeah, well, I could have done that. And the truth is we couldn't because we were dead. But God, but God. So where we are today and our standing in Christ today comes down to what God has done for us. In, the, in, in those verses that outline what God's done for us, there are, th- there are three particular things it highlights, and I just want to touch on each of those for a moment. The first is this. It speaks about God's mercy. God, in raising us from death and giving us new life, God's mercy is extravagant. It isn't just that God is merciful. God is unbelievably merciful. Or or, or let's just quote what it says in that verse. It says, God is so rich in mercy. God is so rich in mercy. That's not just that God's got a lot of this stuff. It's that God gives a lot of this stuff away. God is so rich in mercy that God delights to be merciful to us. Isn't that fantastic? In the Old Testament book of Micah, chapter 7 and verse 18, it asks this question, Who is a God like you, who pardons sins and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of His inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. God delights to show mercy. But God, but God raised us up from death. Why? Because God is so rich in mercy. And let me remind you of this. That the God who opened our hearts to Himself when we were spiritually dead and showed us such great mercy is the God who continues to be and always will be merciful to us. God is rich in mercy. Never forget that. Second thing I want to point out from this verse, that God's love is immeasurable. God's love is immeasurable. It it speaks here about the fact, it says, He loved us so much. I love this. It's not just that God is merciful. It's not just that God loves us. The verse says, because God loves us so much, He raised us from death. God loves us so much. The Apostle John says to his followers in one of his epistles, he said, you know, don't love one another in word only but in deed and in action. And God's immeasurable love is shown to us, not because of what He says, but because of what God has done for us. God's immeasurable love. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, it says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God's love has been poured into our hearts. I'm in a position just now, some of you are in and, and some of you have been in before in, in life where, 
where because of the work I'm having done with my eyes, um, I'm on a regimen of drops. So like if I never see another eye drop in my life, it would be wonderful. But it's like drops in the morning, drops in the evening, drops in between. Uh, and God bless my wife because she puts them in for me. Somebody said to me today, why can't you do your own? I said, I'm not sure where my eye is. She's, she said, those are the two things just above your nose. Uh, but she does, you know, so it's like one drop, bomb, one drop, one drop. God loves us so much. It isn't just a little drop here and a little drop there. God's love has been, what's the word? Poured. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given us. That's how much God loves us. You can see by the extravagance of His love for us. And then if you look on at this next verse in Romans 5 verse 8, it says God demonstrates His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There is the breadth of God's love. God loves us so much that Christ died for us. And then over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 39, there's this terrific statement. Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that terrific? God loves us so much. So much that nothing would ever be able to separate us from His love. That's how much God loves us. Above all, through all, despite all, God always will love us. But God, because of His immeasurable love. And then the third thing I see in, that, in this verse where it speaks about God raising us from death. It talks about the fact that God's grace is unending. It is only by God's grace you have been saved. Only by God's grace you have been saved. Now, it would be easy to think as we move towards our anniversary that um, for a lot of us we've come to a, a, a greater relationship with God or really come into relationship with God since being a part of this church. But I want to tell you this, this church wouldn't be here if it wasn't for one man in the 1500s who made a stand against some of the, print, some of the practices of the Catholic Church where they sold indulgences and could sell blessings and could sell this and sell that. And Martin Luther stood up. And Martin Luther announced the fact that there were five things that were essential for the church to stick to because Scripture taught them. They are called the, the five solas. The word sola meaning alone. And here's what Martin Luther stood for. He said, he said we must stand for Scripture alone. We've got to do things by the book. We stand for faith alone. We stand for grace alone as the means of salvation. We stand for Christ alone as being our substitute. And we, ex we, we exist to bring glory to God alone and to no other person. And one of those was sola grace. Only grace. And it is. The only way that you and I can have a relationship with God, it's only through God's grace. Because remember how we were without Christ? Dead. And what can you do about being dead? Nothing. But God raised us up. Why? Because of His great grace. It is His by grace that we have been saved. Look at this scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But look at this. To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To us who are being saved. Now, I could tell you So, I might look at that day and say, you know, the phrase being saved, unfortunately, has been kind of abused over years. But that's what God did for me that day. So I was saved on May the 13th of 1962. But you know what? Standing here today on September the something or other of 2018, the, 
Nobody knows either. All right, that's good. Ninth, that's good. September the 9th. I must remember that for second service. September the 9th, 2018, standing here today. Here's my testimony is I am still being saved by the power of God. Like God's still working in me. That's why I'm still here, still following Jesus, still serving Jesus. And then look what it says here in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. It says, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So I was saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved by God's wrath through Jesus. How did I pull this off? I didn't. I couldn't. God, because of his incredible mercy and love and grace, has made us alive. Verse 7 there of Ephesians 2 speaks about His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. That, folks, is the foundation. The foundation of our eternal salvation. That is the rock that our faith is established upon. It is in our hopelessness, in our guilt, and in our godlessness. Deserving nothing but God's wrath. Deserving nothing but judgment. Not being able to help ourselves. But God came to where we were. And God has lifted us up. Verse 4 there of Ephesians chapter 2. He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Jesus Christ. Amen. We are united with Jesus Christ. Whatever is going on in your everyday life, family life, work life right now, I tell you what, there's something we really need to recognize. The foundational thing is this. But I am united with Christ Jesus. I'm going to ask our welcome team to come and just move along now, and they're going to pass some buckets along. We've got what we call our celebration cup. It's what we use when we share communion together. Jesus said to his disciples that the night before his crucifixion, he, he, he said, I want you. He took some bread and broke it and shared it with them. He took a cup of wine and he spread, he, he shared it among them and said, pass this among yourselves. And he said, I want you to do this because I want you to remember me. And I felt this morning would be a good morning for us to pause towards the end of our service and just remember and say, God, thank you. I am who I am today. I am where I am today. Because Christ died for my sins. Nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with what I've achieved. Nothing to do with who I am. Only grace. Only grace. God's grace has brought me to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just take a moment just for quiet personal prayer and reflection. Sometimes we don't do enough quiet in life or in our services. But let's just take a few moments just to think through. Remember how dead you were and how alive God has made you. Celebrating His love.